I'm ready to hear your bullshit. <laughs> Talk about you don't like Donnie Darko. What the fuck? I don't not not like it. I just don't think it deserved the hype that it got. What do you mean? I don't understand why it's a cult classic at all. Uh, I mean, I kind of do. See, it's kind of cheesy. And like, what do you mean cheesy? Like um, at the party, the bubble thing that he follows. Not it. The bubble? That's the channel of time. That's yeah. all about that. That's not cheesy. That actually has to do with the story. Like, that's elements in the story. Because that's from the philosophy of time travel. Yeah. The book that Sparrow wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Grandma Death. Mm-mm. And it plus, was it came out in what? 2000? 2001? 2001, yeah. It's like prehistoric, like in terms of CGI. I guess you're right. I don't know. It It didn't age well. Oh, most CGI doesn't, especially yeah. like from the 90s and the early 2000s. It's primordial, literally. Mm. I don't know. It's just one of those yeah. things that it's like a, if you watch a movie, I guess it's aged in a way... I feel like CGI, like we said the earlier with like practical effects and versus visual effects and everything. I don't know. It's never going to age well because there's always going to be something better. Yeah. And people are always going to be used to the newer stuff. But at some point, I feel like if it's there to tell a certain part of visual storytelling, I can forgive it. Especially if it's a old movie like Donnie Darko where it's over 20 years old now and it's like, eh, you know. Yeah. If that came out today, I mean, that'd be a different story. It'd be like, what were y'all doing? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it has some cheese elements to it. But I, I feel it. like it kind of like, it lost my attention the first time I watched it. Mm -hmm. It was very, it was kind of boring. Boring? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's just my take. Like, I don't know. People have talked this movie up so much and it's gotten so much hype that I was expecting something phenomenal and it just wasn't. I don't know. I, th I guess my expectations were too high. Yeah, which I guess that, that kind of goes back to what we talked about in the first episode, where it's like, I guess certain receptions around movies can kind of make you be biased when you're watching it. Yeah. Because my first experience with Donnie Darko, there was no hype around it, and no one had even told me about it. I found the movie on my own and watched it on my own with no expectations whatsoever. And yeah. I was just like, oh, this is awesome. And I kept rewatching it because I found it at Movie Stop in Savannah. Mm -hmm. The director's cut, like DVD, yeah, for like five dollars. And I was so like, oh, yeah. you've seen the version that I haven't seen. Oh, you you didn't watch the director's cut? No, it was on HBO Max. Oh, they have the theatrical on there. Yeah, so I did read about it though that there was more to the ending that kind of brings more understanding to it that. It's kind of left open to interpretation in the theatrical, but I guess there was like extra like 20 minutes of different stuff in the director's cut that kind of added a little bit more understanding to it. Yeah, it fleshes out more of the philosophy of time travel, uh -huh. the book that she wrote. Yeah. It explains more of what's going on in the movie. Yeah. Because like you said, with the theatrical cut, a lot of people can go into it and it's like, this is what really happened, and then this is how everyone's interpreting yeah. what happened. But if you watch the director's cut and you like really pay attention to it, it basically lays out everything of what's going on. And I guess it, I don't know. it. I don't think it ruins the story. It's one of those things where some people, you know, want it to be open-ended and yeah. like interpreting it. And some people are like, no, I want to know what happens. I guess it just depends on which cut you like, depending on that. But it doesn't. I don't feel like it, this is one of those movies that doesn't make it worse or better either way. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. First time watching it, you're so used to like psychological movies and like darker movies and stuff that there being a plot twist. And with this, you're expecting him to just be schizophrenic. <laughs> but they lead you to they the idea is that you really do, you're supposed to believe that the time travel thing is legit, and that's what happens. Yeah. But I wasn't expecting that, like, w as I was watching it the first time, I was expecting for him to just be schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. And so when then when the end happened, I was just kind of like, what? <laughs> did, did he imagine this? Like, <laughs> Well, that, again, that goes into, 
do you want to hear the metaphor way of it or right. do you want to hear what really happened yeah because like the metaphor way of looking at it is the the jesus savior complex yeah and that's kind of what his whole thing was that he sacrifices himself for the greater good and the open-ended way of looking at it is it doesn't really matter if it happened or not if it was all in his head either way him sacrificing himself and choosing not to leave the bed when the jet engine falls makes for a better reality according to his mind yeah because he saves the girl yeah and that's all that matters to him but if you actually watch the director's cut and then there's the whole philosophy of time travel book it it like overly explains everything that happens so basically when the jet engine comes in and lands the first time and he's not in the bed it's basically opening an alternate timeline yeah and he is in that alternate timeline all the way up until the numbers on his arm, where the world is going to end. That's where the alternate timeline ends, and then he has to choose whether to stick with the alternate timeline that he's created by not being in the bed, or cause the jet engine from the plane in this reality to go back in time again, land in his bed, and this time he's in there and it kills him. So the alternate timeline never happens, so it just cuts it off, yeah. and it goes back to regular flow of time. That's basically, in a nutshell, what's going on in the whole god's channel thing it, it goes into all of that with time travel like with the stephen hawking book yeah where it's like you know if you can see what you're gonna do is there really a choice because you can choose not to do it and it's like and he was debating with the teacher and he was right. like well not if you're operating in god's channel because if you're in god's channel it's all predetermined but it's meant to be that way yeah and if you operate in god's channel then it doesn't matter so it's one of those things that it's It can get real fuzzy because you're mixing science and faith. But I think it's done in such a good way. It's kind of like contact with Matthew McConaughey and Mm -hmm. Jodie Foster. It mixes science and faith in such a good way that both sides, I think, could see it either way. And it doesn't matter if you're religious or faithful or not or if you're just science-based. You could look at it either way and be like, oh, this is really interesting in the way it's kind of telling the story. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what he was going for with all the, <laughs> the the weird time travel stuff because it it is all over the place and there's like that funny meme that went around with Jake Gyllenhaal where he's holding the sign and it's like Donnie Darko doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah, I I was reading about it and uh, after the like uh, the after the filming was over party, mm-hmm. it, Jake Gyllenhaal and Seth Rogen both said that they had no idea what the movie was about <laughs> after they were done filming it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of people are like that. Yeah. And it's Richard Kelly. He's the director. And a lot of his, he's only made like three movies, I think. And his other one was Southland Tales, which was one of the most booed movies at Cannes Film Festival ever. Cannes, Can, Con, however you say it. But it, it got. Oh, Canes? Canes. The Canes Film Festival? Cannes, Canes, yeah. Canes. <laughs> There's no, I don't know how to say I'm it. I'm pretty sure it's Canes. I've heard it. Raising Canes? Yeah, basically. Chicken? I'm just kidding. Yeah. We should probably look it up. Can Film Festival. But <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure it's Canes, the Canes Film Festival. I'm, I would put money on it. Okay. But I know that his film, Southland Tales, got like booed yeah. at that festival. And apparently it's the same kind of thing. I've seen it, but it's it's the same kind of thing if you don't really care for his style of direction or care for his storytelling. He makes a lot of like weird movies that are very open to interpretation Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff not really explained very well you have to really look into it and really dive deep and try and pull something out of it to understand it yeah and i guess you know how people are with movies like that some people either you either want to put in the effort and try and get something out of it or you're just like "Ah, i'd rather just you know watch a movie i like instead of trying to sit here and dissect this one i I mean i i like dissecting movies yeah but it's like the whole thing with frank Mm mm-hmm on the first watch, it just—it's a movie you really do have to watch multiple times. Oh, yeah. I think, it, like going into it, if you don't know what what to expect when you go into it, because I didn't know what it was about at all. But then, then after like rewatching it, like today, like the whole thing with Frank at the end, mm-hmm. after he hits, was her name Gretchen? Yeah, the I girl. So. Um, after he hits her and he gets out of the car and he's in the bunny suit. And he gets shot in the eye and stuff. That's when. That's what really like makes you pull it all together. Mm-hmm. And 
it's really like him through the second timeline, like leading him through everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I just don't, I don't know. I mean, th- this is one of those movies I would I would have a hard time explaining it to somebody. Like you said, going into it, you don't know what you're expecting. Yeah. And it's like you don't know what you're getting into. I would be hard pressed to sit there and like try and convince someone to watch this. Like the first time I got you to watch the movie, how do you explain to someone what Donnie Darko is about? It's a time travel movie. <laughs> that's what I would tell people. I mean, that's like saying Tenet is a time travel movie because it's like. It is. It's time entropy. <laughs> reversing oh, time my bad same thing but no i mean it, it's one of those things where it's like it, ge- it gets into dimensional stuff religious stuff science stuff and even philosophical stuff like the whole days ex- days ex machina thing yeah it's it, it still blows my mind trying to figure that out because days ex machina is basically the god machine and it's a plot device that's used in movies and like plays and novels and stuff where it basically just comes out of nowhere it's illogical and it makes the storyline work yeah but in this movie richard kelly uses this meta weird thing that's basically a plot device for storytelling in the actual story and makes it into a device that the character actually uses rather than the actual author of the story would be using yeah so it's weird meta in that way yeah where it's like instead of the director putting in a Deus Ex Machina in his story, it's like the director is giving the character the free will to control the narrative of the film. Yeah, because he could choose to get in the bed or not. Yeah, like he could choose to let her actually be dead and let the timeline that he's created now where he's exposed, you know, the pedophile, where he's yeah killed this kid, where he's done this, actually let all that be the true to real life. But it's weird because it's one of those things where it's like, do you really agree with what he did by not letting all that happen because all those people wake up in the middle of the night and they know what happened because they all have the dreams and they all saw it because everyone still knows what happens in the alternate timeline just hasn't happened in this one so it's like does he still expose them by people knowing everything that happened in the alternate timeline or do people just assume it's a dream and just let it go yeah i mean i would think that they let it go yeah but i don't know you know because that's true i didn't think about it like that Like, the pedophile doesn't get caught anymore. Yeah. But he saves Gretchen, Frank, Mm -hmm. his little sister, and his mom. Yeah. And it's like, is it personally worth it, you know? Like, that's what I'm saying. But he's also saved himself from having to live with, like, the fact that he killed somebody also. Yeah. And the fact that he caused his girl to die. Yeah. Because I think that's the whole thing with the deus ex machina thing that's so interesting is that he puts the letter in grandma death's mailbox Mm -hmm. to save her from getting hit by a car yeah but her getting the letter and not getting hit by the car causes them to veer off and hit his girlfriend Mm -hmm. so it's like him trying to save grandma death caused his girl to die and then caused him to have to kill frank so it's kind of like it's a whole clusterfuck that he just he just had no intention of what he was going to do and then he sees the of course the the deus ex machina, I guess, is what you would call that, is the god machine sitting yeah. over his house. And he was like, oh, so that's what I have to do. I either have to bring the jet engine back and kill myself or just let it go and then just live out what I've done. And it's like, I don't know, it's so interesting to me. I think it's so creative. And I've rewatched it. I've also super biased on this. That, Like you said, it's one of those things you can pick up a lot from rewatching. I've rewatched this movie probably like over 20 times. Since I saw it in like 2015, <laughs> yeah. When it kind of makes you think what you would about what you would do morally, because yeah. you know people die in your life and things happen, so it's like, is that worth letting the pedophile still roam the school? Like yeah. you just wanting to save your loved ones and being selfish, it, it really, really makes you think. Yeah, because it it's one of those things like you really don't know what would really be the right choice. Yeah. Especially in the way of, like, I guess if you look at it from the religious standpoint, you know, Jesus dying for everyone's sins, he even forgives everyone's sins that did him wrong. That's true. And caused him to be on the cross to begin with. That's true. So it's one of those things where it's like, uh, Yeah. It's it's battling with the the moral compass of it all. And same with him just 
<laughs> I love that line, too, where he's sitting there listening to the creep dude sitting there give his speech in the school and telling everyone how they need to live in love and not fear. And he's like, I, I think you're the fucking Antichrist. <laughs> That's one of my favorite quotes ever. Yeah. Every, every time I watch it, it makes me laugh. Because he's like, you're living in fear, son. You're living in fear. He's like, yeah, I am, but I think you're the fucking Antichrist. <laughs> it makes it so much better that it's Patrick Swayze also. Yeah. Especially since I do not like him. Really? No. I've never seen a movie where I've been impressed with Patrick Swayze. I think I've seen one Patrick Swayze movie, and it was Ghost, and I saw it when I was a kid. You haven't seen, like, Roadhouse or no. Dirty Dancing? or no. Yeah, I mean, I don't like it. I think he was also in Point Break with Keanu, the original one. Yeah, I never saw that either. I've never really He was in The Outsiders. I yeah, saw, that's right. I saw that. He was in The Outsiders, too. I guess I didn't mind him in that one. Yeah. Because I actually like that movie. But that movie has a stacked cast. Yeah, for, for sure. No reason as a stack cast, but <laughs> but yeah, I've never been impressed with Patrick Swayze. So it is that makes me enjoy the movie more. Yeah, being able to sit there and just shit on Patrick Swayze. It's like yeah. I suck. read that in the golf scene when you first see him yeah. when Donnie wakes up on the golf course that Patrick Swayze is wearing his own clothes from the 1980s. Is he really? Yes. <laughs> it matches pretty well. Yeah. I mean, he just looks like a a weird dad that would be out there. It's also, did you notice, like, the little inserts they put in there? Like, I don't know if you noticed on Rewatch, but you can actually pick out that he's a creep before he's exposed. I did not notice that. In one of the, um, what's it called? Like, the infomercial videos that they're oh, showing? Oh, he hits a little boy on the butt. Yes. Yes. He slaps his butt. Yes. When he puts him down. And I was just like, oh, my God. Yeah. It's right there in plain sight. Yeah. And everyone's just like, huh. Eh. Mm-hmm. And then the, the mom. <laughs> When she shows up to her house when the God is Awesome shirt, and yes. she's like, I doubt your commitment to Sparkle Motion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talking about how she wants to go defend a pedophile mm-hmm. in the name of defending everything that she has. Well, she has to. She's put everything into this man. Yeah. And it's just, it's so ironic that it's great. Yeah. And it's it's played out in such a – and I think those are, that's one of the ways that it's like the corniness has aged well. Yeah. Because it was intentionally campy, and it's so damn funny still to this day. Like, we well, you know, too, it's always those people that defend the pedophiles. It's like yeah. always it, – it, It's aged so well. Yeah. Because even when he gets exposed and it's in the newspaper and stuff, the news and, and everything in the movie is immediately talking about how it's a conspiracy to bring down – Everything that he's done and everything. Well, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. It's I like it's conspiracy. Tra- yeah, I lost <laughs> my train of thought on that one. It was the mom, he, their mom, when she opens the door, she's like, "Yeah, I heard about the kitty porn dungeon." And she's like, "Don't say that." It's <laughs> like, it's always the ones that can't handle it that are the ones protecting them. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it was in it was in a secret room behind a portrait in his house, and yeah. it's a conspiracy. It's like it was like locked away in a safe they in his found home. It. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, I don't think that's a conspiracy. Why else would that be in his home? <laughs> Somebody planted that? It's like the Epstein stuff. It's a conspiracy. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the eyes wide shut weirdos. It's all just a conspiracy to cover up their motivations in some way or another. But uh, that's Richard Kelly's good at that in all of his movies. Because Southland Tales is a satire. It might it, have been loud in there. I apologize. No, it's fine. It's like a... It's a super satire, mm-hmm. kind of like Doctor Strangelove and stuff like that, or like Starship Troopers, where it's basically an attack on the whole social economic world at the time, yeah. and it's aged very well. It's it has a lot of political stuff and a lot of like weird stuff like that, where it's kind of like prophesizing in a way, and it feels weirdly or eerily too close to home at times. It's like this is this is come off way too <laughs> yeah close to home at the moment, which I mean. I, I think that's why it got booed so much. Because mm-hmm. a lot of people, satire is weird. It's one of those things where people either get it or they don't. Yeah. Or they just don't care to get it. That's like uh, Don't Look Up. Yes. I That movie was so plainly satire. It was so it, such exaggerated satire. Yes. And there were so many people that were mad about it. And I'm like, this wasn't supposed to be serious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't serious at all. And my... I wasn't the biggest fan of Don't Look Up, yeah. uh, but I got I got it was a satire. My problem with Don't Look Up is that Adam McKay is a director. I mm-hmm. think he's very incompetent. 
and it's just <laughs> like the, that whole scene where Leo is explaining the meaning of the song yeah. in the car to them while they're listening to the song and it's yeah. like a competent director would just let them sit in the car listening to the lyrics and the audience would hear the lyrics and it would click for them and be right. like oh it's symbolic it's a metaphor i get yeah. it rather than having a character talk over the lyrics to explain the lyrics to the characters and the audience at the same time and that was not a satire moment either so yeah. it's one of those things where it's like it's too much you spoon feeding yeah. are we spelling it out for us <laughs> like we get it dude <laughs> just let the movie go speaking of songs i really like the soundtrack for donnie darko yes it has a good soundtrack. oh my god the one of my favorite needle drops in movie history is when they're jumping out of the back of the school bus and mm -hmm. the Tears for Fears song yeah. starts playing and it says Mongrel's Rule on the back of it and it's that great shot where the camera is like sideways mm -hmm. and it flips this way and follows them into the school. I The first time I ever saw that shot, I when I in my dorm room, I was just sitting there, I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> That's something that can like make or break a movie sometimes and you don't think a soundtrack can necessarily be that important a needle drop but it yeah. is yeah yeah i, I agree because there's like certain times where you see a movie and they either pick really bad songs or songs that are so just basic or they don't know how to properly integrate a needle drop into the scene and it automatically just pulls you out yeah. you're like ah that that's sucked. why the twilight movies are so good it's the soundtracks Hey, I will admit, <laughs> I will admit, New Moon, that soundtrack, is pretty crazy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's got isn't that the one with Decode and? No, that's the first one. Well, Decode, okay, the first one also has a good one then yeah. too, because Decode by Paramore is great. But then the second one, I think, has Hearing Damage by Tom York. I'm not sure about that one. I think it's Hearing Damage by Tom York. But yeah, I mean, both the Twilight movies have crazy good soundtracks for no reason. I think one of them has Bon Iver on there too. <laughs> I can't remember if it's the first or second or both. I feel like there's a Bonnie Vare song in both. Yeah. Still, they go hard. Oh, yeah. And this one, the soundtrack for Donnie Darko goes hard. Yeah. For no reason. Yeah. And I love the opening shot to this That's movie. what I was going to say. That's oh. what, like, immediately drawed me in was the song playing while he's riding his bike back home. Yeah. Yeah. When he wakes up in the middle of the road, and it's just him looking out over all those mountains. It just looks so good. I don't know if they color graded it that way or if it was just the film grain. It just looked too good to me. Well, and the opening scene is very, like, contrasting because Donnie looks dark. <laughs> like, he just does. Like, you can tell that this kid is, like, going through something or he looks like he's going through Compared something. Compared to his background and yeah, surroundings. Yeah, and as, as he's, like, riding the bike, it's all these huge-ass houses, people. You know, his dad's blowing out the driveway, playing with his sister. You know, everything's yeah cool and calm, but you could tell something's wrong with this kid. Yeah. He definitely seems out of place. Yeah. And I think that was kind of the point is the alienation factor. Yeah. And it's so funny to me to like him and his therapy sessions and how he doesn't want to be going to therapy. But at the same time, he kind of enjoys it because it's the only time he can actually sit there and talk about the actual shit that's going on. Like him seeing Frank the Bunny and everything. Yeah. And his parents didn't even know about Frank the Bunny. And him talking to his friends, too, about the whole like Smurfette thing. Yeah. It's so funny that he's just so against the grain like he doesn't even seem like a regular teenage boy right how they're like oh yeah you want a cigarette and they like start smoking and he's like this is some good shit in it and donnie darker's like it's a cigarette like, right <laughs> 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 like even he doesn't play into the stereotypical kind of little i guess like freshman high school i guess he's a freshman in high school i would guess yeah because his sister is a senior because she yeah. just got into harvard yeah, that's what I, I so felt like. So he's younger than that. Because I didn't think they were in middle school. No. I feel like they were in high school. Yeah. Because even the teachers seem like high school teachers. Yeah, but his littler sister, Samantha's going to the same school, but they're in a private school. That's so true. it could be all grades. There's no telling. Yeah. I don't think they ever really explained it, what grades they were in, but I, I love the whole school dynamics too. Like yeah. him and the, the two teachers. I love them because they reminded oh, yeah. me of the cool teachers of like yeah. Mary Persons, especially like with the, are you about to say? <laughs> the get out? Yes. <laughs> Is that not Magda? Yes. That was my first thought. I'm like, I've heard him say that so many times. Yeah. As soon as I, the first time I saw that movie also was like, I was a freshman in college. So I just got out of high school. And I, as soon as he said that, I was just like, that's high school right there. Yes. You got that one kid that's going to say some stupid shit. And then the teacher's so exasperated. Just get out. Yeah. Just come on, dude. Like turn your brain on. Get the fuck out. What are you doing? You know, um, Drew Barrymore. Her character's great. I love her character, yeah. but she, 
I can't remember the context, but she was in a situation where I don't know if she was doing a movie with uh, Richard Kelly or if they were just at like a premiere at the same time or whatever, but her company, Flower Productions, actually produced this movie. Oh, yeah, I saw that at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I thought was interesting because this movie was so long ago, and um, Drew Barrymore has a cosmetic line called Flower also. Mm. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's kind of like been her thing for a long time. But a lot of people do their own production companies. Like yeah. Ridley Scott has his, Scott Free, with Tony Scott before Scott, he took his own life and everything. Mm-hmm. So I think that would be interesting to look into also to see if maybe Richard Kelly, I guess, worked with. I wonder if she had anything to do with Southland Tales or anything because they were all kind of made within the same time. Yeah. But yeah, but I don't know. That is cool, though, because I know her character in this movie is feels so integral yeah. to the entire plot. And it's so funny because her and the, um, I guess, the science teacher. Mm-hmm. They they both know it's Donnie Darko the whole time that's doing everything. Yeah. And you have that great scene where they're just both sitting in the break room eating, and he's just like, Donnie Darko. And she's like, yep. <laughs> like they, they both know the whole yeah. time. And all the other teachers are like, suspect of him, and everyone thinks he's off. But they're the only two teachers that, like, love him. Yeah. Because they just think he's great. Yeah, because, I mean, in that open, opening, well, not the opening scene, but, like, the first scene of, her in the classroom, mm-hmm. and she asks him about the book, and he actually has something interesting and intelligent to say about it. Yeah, he understood it, and right. then she repeats it at the PTA meeting. Yeah. Because he was like, yeah, it's ironic. The ending is because it's destruction is a form of creation. And then when the the uh, Bible-thumping lady is trying to get the book banned, yeah, old Nazi style, she's like, hey, why are we teaching this? This is horrible. <laughs> They're talking about burning books and breaking into old men's homes in this book and then the, t- the drew barrymore teacher's literally like it's supposed to be ironic <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> she just literally just took what donnie darko said and was just like he got it yeah and apparently not even like this grown-up doesn't even get it and even donnie darko's parents are like do you even know graham green <laughs> <laughs> like are, are we for real right now i thought right. we were supposed to be talking about our kids <laughs> and you're talking about wanting to ban books you're wanting to ban books because they burned the books in the book <laughs> Iron, right? <laughs> Irony. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's right there in front of you. The principal too, though. He just—he looks like he's having a rough, especially in the scene where <laughs> the the lifeline scene, mm-hmm. where she's like, "Love, fear," and Donnie Darko gets up there and it's like, "Life is much more complicated than these two categories. You can't just ignore the whole range of human emotions." <laughs> and she's like, "Well, you have to do the assignment, or you get a zero. And it just, he's about to say something, and it just cuts to black, yeah. and then he's in the principal's and office. And she says, I'll tell you what he said. <laughs> he told me to forcibly insert the lifeline into my anus. <laughs> and you just see the dad over there just <laughs> trying to hold in a laugh. <laughs> oh, wait, he did laugh, but then yeah. he, like, faked it as, like, a cough. And yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell the mom's just over there just like. <laughs> She's like. It's so funny because I feel like the mom is so relatable. Yeah. Because she doesn't ever want to punish Donnie because she doesn't think anything he's doing is wrong. Yeah, I mean, he has pretty decent parents. They're not, not like, overbearing, and they try to be understanding, and they're mm-hmm. they're kind of chill. Like, they're not the typical movie parents where they're, like, suffocating him and what's wrong with you. and. Yes. Yeah. That I think that's also one of my favorite parts is that they actually feel like real – parents right like the, like the whole debate at the dinner table about her wanting to vote yeah for the opposite Dukakis. person from the parents yeah and it's like you really think dukakis can provide for your family <laughs> until you want to push one out <laughs> <laughs> like they're just debating about it and it's so funny to me and she writes it on the dry board on the refrigerator it's like vote dukakis and the dad sees it getting a beer from watching the game he's just like dukakis, whatever <laughs> And I I just think that kind of stuff, it makes the family feel so much more realistic, even though the movie is not grounded in realism whatsoever. But the family feels very real. I think it helped, too, that Jake Gyllenhaal and Maggie Gyllenhaal were brother and sister. Real siblings. Yeah. Yeah. And the little sister is so funny, too. She's just goofing off the whole time, just not having a care in the world, and she's just hearing everything. Like when they get in the fight at the table, and she's like, what's what's a fuck ass? Yeah. (laughs) And, and the, the dad, dad just start, laughs. Yeah, just the dad's always just laughing, and the mom's just. <laughs> but I do like that they they're not like the constrained, constricting parents. Yeah, 
Like, they're pretty like chill. Like, the overbearing dad and the hysterical mom. Yeah. yeah. It's not stereotypical at all. The mom just wants the best for her kids while yeah. at the same time trying to guide them in some way. Like, sh- like I said, she doesn't really think Donnie's doing bad shit. But it's more just like he doesn't have any bedside manner about who he's doing it to. Yeah. Like, doing, he did it to the one lady that's going to go to the principal and complain and have to call the parents and everything. It's like... And it's the lady that has the daughter in the sparkle motion thing with her. Exactly. It's just like that annoying PTA mom. Yes. Because even the dad is like, you know, he, she kind of deserved it. Yeah. Even he said that. And the mom's like, I know, but that's not the point. And even like, uh, but with the, like when he calls her a bitch at the beginning of the movie, because she's like, what happened to my son? You're not my son. Mm-hmm. And then she goes and just goes in the bedroom and is like, our son just called me a bitch. And the dad's just like, you're bitching. <laughs> but you're not a bitch. <laughs> it just feels all very realistic. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. Because I think that's good writing. Yeah. From Richard Kelly. Like, if you can write characters like that, I feel like that's so much better writing-wise than just writing stereotypical yeah. characters. Which I feel like that's how Donnie Darko shines the most. It subverts almost everything, I feel like. Yeah. And I feel like that's why it's so hard for people to grasp it. And I feel like that's also why it's very divided and probably has a cult following. Yeah. Like, because like you said, it's, it is a cult classic. And I feel like that's just because a lot of people relate to it. And then there's a lot of people that are like, oh, this is overhyped. I don't really get it. It feels kind of weird. And then a lot of people are just like. Well, I feel like it's overhyped for the wrong reasons. Like, I think, like, teenagerdom things. Like, it's very, it's cult classic in the way of teenager hot topic emo style. Where it's, like, these people attach to it because it's dark and, like, Frank the Bunny is creepy and it's, they try to take, like, the schizophrenic, like, freaky style for the movie, but that's not really what it's about. So it's overhyped for the wrong reasons. I completely agree. Uh, I completely agree. And that's one of my, that's one of my biggest issues with movies in the, in the, I guess, for the most part, is the, the people that gravitate towards stuff. I knew the first time I saw Joker, I was going to be like, this is going to be a movie that's going to have a million YouTube videos of what really happened in Joker. Yeah. Was Joker right? What Did Joaquin Phoenix's character do the right thing? And I knew it was going to have a whole bunch of debates about it. People were going to tear it to shreds thinking it's some political statement and it's super dark and it's yeah. going to be the next Dark Knight trilogy where everyone's like, this is how superhero movies should be. Saw all that coming from a mile away. And literally like two months after I saw it in theaters, all that shit started happening. And the whole movie just kind of gets ruined for everybody because of that. Because it's like, it's not that deep. Yeah. It's a it's a Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie. And yeah. it just copies a whole bunch of other movies. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't that deep. And anyone that thinks it is, it's like, uh, watch more movies, bud. And then same with like Donnie Darko. I'm biased for it though. I think it is amazing. But I think the culture and the fan base around it fucking sucks. Like you said, it's just all the really emo, dark people, and they're just like, oh, yeah, I'm different because I like Donnie Darko. Yeah. <laughs> or, like, the fucking, they put Frank the Bunny in Call of Duty. Yeah. And all these people bought Frank the Bunny, and it's like, how many of you have actually seen Donnie yeah. Darko? And it's like, y'all put this in here for Halloween and everything, like, to be creepy? It's like, I don't even think Donnie Darko is really a scary movie. Like, I, don't even, I wouldn't even consider it. No, scary at all or horror esque at all. So why is it being put in with the same time as? It's not even really a thriller. No, it's not. I would say it's if anything, it's probably like a drama. Yeah. Any if anything, like I, I don't think any part of it is really scary, horror based or thriller based or anything. You know, speaking of drama, this came out in two thousand one, and I don't know what month it came out, but it came out kind of close to nine eleven. So the theatrical release cut some of the plane scenes out, and it made it tank at the box office, but it got, like, more views on the DVD release because it was the actual movie. So people liked it better because it probably made more fucking sense when it had the whole movie. Oh, yeah. For sure. Which a yeah. lot of movies get... A lot of people... A lot of movies do that shit. You know, and I don't... I don't mean it in a disrespectful way, but... I don't know. The two don't mean it doesn't make a difference, you know? Like, it doesn't have to mean anything. Like, the tiptoeing over things. What do you mean? Like, cutting the the plane scenes out because 9-11 happened. They're not connected. And, you know, 
I, I don't know. I know, I agree. It's, it's too much, like. Because they did that shit with Scream. Yeah. After Columbine. Yeah. They were like, take out more of the violence in Scream. And it's like, what what the fuck does the Scream franchise have it's to do with movie. a mass murder? If you can't handle, you know what to expect when you go into a movie like that. Yeah. You just do. And you might not have been expecting the plane scenes for in Donnie Darko, but it's just kind of like, if it bothers you, walk out. Yeah. Like, you don't have to watch it. Yeah. But. I mean, maybe I'm just an insensitive asshole, but I could care less. Like, if yeah. a movie does something, it's like, if you don't like and it, And I don't, don't say that it. to downplay 9-11 because it was horrible, but that is separate from yeah. going to enjoy a movie. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. If you're a studio exec and you were watching, like, dailies of Donnie Darko. Right. And you're about to release in theaters and then 9-11 happens, you're like, oh, my God, this movie about a kid who's having mental problems and sees bunnies needs to take out the scenes with planes in it. Like, right. <laughs> what? No. That's like you saying you went through a horrible divorce, so... Don't watch Marriage Story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't go watch it if you think it's going to trigger you. Yeah. But I guess that's easier said than done for some people. Yeah. I mean, you know, some people are em- really emotionally attached to movies. Like, some well, people can't watch stuff like I Blue Valentine because they're like, it, it triggers me. And it's like, Well, I am okay. a person who's very emotionally guided by movies. Yeah. But you can't just hide away in your home forever and block everything out. Like, you have to feel and deal and... Those are the people that only watch Disney movies and only subscribe to Disney Plus. Yeah. Like, I just want to watch my animated characters and my superhero movies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ignore the rest of the world. <laughs> I don't know. A lot of movies get so much shit like that for no reason. And again, I feel like that's just the culture and everything surrounding it. It's so aggravating. Well, and to go back to what you were saying, too, about... um, I lost it again. This never happens to me when I, we were recording Stuck in a Side Quest, but it happens all the time when I'm talking to you. It's because um, I talk too much. No. Um, I was going to say something. Oh, about having to, like, dive into the movies and, like, critique it to death. I am very much leave things as they were. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to know, every you, like, how it ended. Like, movies that just end and stuff like that. Most of the time, I'm you know, I'm cool with it. Like... Yeah, those are some of the best movies, too. We don't have to have a part two, and we don't have to know the reasons why, and it ended the way it did on purpose. Yeah. Those are those are some of my least favorite videos to ever see, or any my least favorite articles to ever see, and that's yeah. what most movie criticism has become nowadays, is where people only sit there and think that they can like a movie if they understand it exactly, and then most of the time, by understanding it, it just means that these people just go to some kind of fan page or look up something on YouTube or just read some article where they explain the ending to them. And they're like, Oh yeah, I have a take on this movie. And guess what? It's the one that I read off the internet from someone else. <laughs> right. And that means I can like it cause I get it. And it's like, <laughs> no, that's not how that works. And that's not film criticism. Yeah. Like, you know, make your own interpretation. Like the ending of no country for old men is one of the best endings ever. And it's, amazing like that because it is so out of left field and just leaves you with nothing. I haven't seen that. Really? Really? Oh my god. It's well, on my watch list. Well, Cohen Brothers are great at doing that. They yeah. did it in Blood Simple, they did it in A Serious Man, and they did it in No Country for Old Men, and they've done it in countless other movies because they've made so many. But just off the top of my head, those three right there, all the endings just kind of just just shut it off. And you're yeah. kind of just sitting there in black just looking at the screen and all the titles start coming up and you're just like, You're like, that's amazing. That That's the kind of stuff that's life-changing, in my opinion. Which that, I don't know. That yeah. might just be me, me overhyping something. But I love it when movies kind of just sit there and just end on you. And you have to actually sit there for a second and think on it. And you're just kind of lost in yourself. Yeah. Like, just, oh, my God. And you just, <laughs> you basically just picture, like, your brain just kind of just floating off. You have to sit there and think about it for days to understand it. That's the best shit to me. It's yeah. movies that stick with you. There's nothing worse than a movie that you watch and it's just the most forgettable thing ever. And the next day you're just like, oh, yeah, I did see that. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I like movies that sit with you for, like, weeks and you're just like, what was that? Yeah. And I feel like Donnie Darko is one of those for me. And that's kind of one of the reasons I love it. It it's stuck with me ever since I saw it. And I've continually rewatched it over the years. And I always find something new in it and always find something new to tear apart and pick at and i'm just like this is great i told scott that 
uh, Donnie Darko is your Requiem for a Dream for me <laughs> because I like that movie and feel the same way about it that you do Donnie Darko. Yeah. But you hate <laughs> hate that movie <laughs> and vice versa. Like I didn't hate Donnie Darko, but I just didn't. It's not like something I'd sit down and watch. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess Requiem for a Dream just feels too too much. Like I said before, just like a glorified dare ad. Don't do drugs. I think the whale and stuff like that, and like the wrestler, other things that Darren Aronofsky has done, gets into addiction a lot better than the way Requiem for a Dream does. I mean, but that's because I feel like Requiem for a Dream was one of his earlier movies. So he made it shock factor intentionally to get people's attention. A lot of directors do that, where their older films are intentionally very controversial and very shock factors to get people to talk about them. Right. So they can stay in the zeitgeist and stay in the conversation so they can make more movies. So again, I don't really think that's necessarily his fault. I think that was more of just him wanting to make sure that it's like, this is going to get some people's attention and they're not going to forget about me and I can actually keep making movies. Yeah, I mean... I don't agree, <laughs> but we could probably just do an episode about it. Definitely. Yeah. We definitely can. Yeah. Do, is there anything else you want to say about Donnie Darko? Yeah. Um, something that caught my attention was that they went and saw Evil Dead in the theater. And, of course, that drew my attention because I, I like that whole franchise or whatever. But um, Did you see the second film that was on the marquee? Yes, but I can't remember it now. The Last Temptation yes, of Christ yes. by Martin Scorsese. Yes. <laughs> um, but that was originally not supposed to be Evil Dead. It was supposed to be a movie called Chud. Chud! But they couldn't get the rights to it. Like That's They didn't hilarious. know who had the rights, and they couldn't figure it out. So Rami Malek said that they could use Evil Dead, and he let them use it for free. You just said Rami Malek. That's not what I meant. Sam Raimi. Yes, yeah, Sam Raimi. Whoops. <laughs> That's funny, though, that they want yeah. to use Chud. Yeah. Because that's such like a creature feature B movie. Like, I feel like Evil Dead fit it pretty well. Yeah, I agree. And it's something that other people would recognize. Yeah. And not that it, either one of those movies is really related to what's going on in Donnie Darko, but what? I would say they do have a little bit going on, like, kind of relating to it. I mean, Evil Dead, supernatural s stuff about yeah. some kind of. Because Evil Dead is based off Lovecraftian stuff. Like, uh-huh. the Necronomicon and everything was all from Lovecraft. Yeah. And that's kind of cosmic horror and all that. Which, this movie, I don't think Donnie Darko's horror. But I think it's kind of cosmic. Yeah. In a way that it goes, like, dimensional and everything. And it's kind of not meant to be understood. But at the same time, you can tear it apart and understand it. Yeah. And then The Last Temptation of Christ goes back to the the Savior stuff. And yeah. how it's kind of a metaphor about how he's sacrificing himself for this. Because Last Temptation of Christ ends with... Basically, Christ imagining this whole life that he could live if he didn't sacrifice himself Mm -hmm. on the cross for everyone's sins. That was the last temptation as he saw this whole life play out for himself where he actually had a family, had a wife, all this. But he couldn't get it because he had to do this thing. Yeah. Die for everyone's sins. So I think it's one of the I think that kind of perfectly metaphorically ties into Donnie Darko where he's like he sees this whole alternate timeline of this life that he could live but he has to do this thing yeah I get that one but just like Chud or Chud yeah it makes no fucking sense yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's totally irrelevant Evil Dead is definitely a good replacement yeah what do you have on here that was it just these points I wanted to bring up the other you one. even had Sam Raimi written down and she still said Raimi Malik. well try not to look at the paper <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you um, well, so is there anything else you want to say about Donnie Darko? It was asked. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, you can say that. No, it, I just think it, it's kind of mid. Yeah. I mean, that's perfectly In fine. In my opinion. Yeah. I showed it to two of my friends one time in Savannah. When after I found it at Movie Stop, I watched it like twice in one week, and then I was like, "Movie night, y'all have to come watch this movie." And I showed it to them, and after it ended, they were both just like, "What the fuck was that?" <laughs> <laughs> and I explained it to them like the whole time, travel thing, dropping the jet engine on himself, cutting off the timeline, all of that stuff. Because the DVD set that I got came with the book. Uh huh. So I read that shit, looked at uh-huh. all the deleted scenes, looked at all the extra stuff, explained the whole thing to him, and then both of them were just like, "Yeah, that, that's just dumb." And I was just like, "Okay." 
<laughs> so I'm saying it's just not some people it's just not their thing. Yeah. And for some people like me, it's just like I just love it. I can't explain it. And then you have all the hot topic kids that also. I mean, just love it's it. definitely <laughs> different. Yes. It's definitely original. I'll give it that. Yeah. I think that's what I like about it most. It's yeah. I've never seen a movie like it. Yeah. Still to this day. And I, I that those are the kind of movies I like where it's so original and so idiosyncratic. Like that is Richard Kelly's movie, and there will probably never be another Donnie Darko, because it's just it's in its own little bubble. Didn't they make a part two? Yes, it's one of the worst things ever created. It's called S Darko, right? About his little sister, Samantha. Yeah, it's fucking garbage. What happens is it just like her going through the same shit. Basically, yeah. Oh. Jeez. Yeah, but it's even dumber because it doesn't make sense, and they basically try and reuse the same plot points from the first one and everything, and it's like, what? What's what are the we doing? time difference between those two movies? She's like a college student now, I believe, or she just graduated high school. Like she's older. So was it something that they came out with like ten years later, trying to like make more money off the franchise, like make it into a franchise? That's what it seems like. Yeah, and apparently Richard Kelly has a writing credit for that movie. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it's one of those situations where they just gave him a writing credit because it's based off Donnie Darko. Yeah. I don't think he actually sat down and wrote S. Darko. Mm-hmm. I think they just knew it was based off his original story. So they're like, all right, we have to just give him a writing credit for this. Yeah. But we're just making a sequel just to see how much we can milk this shit. And it just tanked. And sure. also is one of the worst like rated movies ever. I watched it just because, again, I watched it outside of a vacuum. I had no idea about the reception of it or anything. I was just like, oh, there's a second one. Yes, and I watched it, and I was just like, this is one of the worst fucking movies I've ever seen. Why did they do this? Yeah, I'll have to check it out just to see what it is. It's garbage. (laughs) It's bad. (laughs) You remember the difference between the Gore Verbinski's uh, American remake of The Ring? Uh Uh-huh. And then The Ring 2? Yeah. Remember that drop in quality? Yeah. It's like that. Is it like the butterfly effect? Yeah, where the second one kind of has... college. The second one has, like, really nothing to do. Yeah. First one, they just kind of milk it and try and copy it. Yeah. Yeah, basically. I gotcha. Yeah. Trash. <laughs> Trash. All right. We out? I think so. We out this bitch? Yeah. All right. I feel like we talked for, like, 15 minutes. I'll yeah. check the time, but I think we got a good amount. Bye, everyone. That's it for Cinequest 2. Donnie Darko rules. Katie has no idea what she's talking about.